So, uh, first off, um, trying to understand what role P will play, uh, in your view, in the funding market versus some of the traditional funding, public markets, public equity, public debt, uh, and, and other forms of funding, streamers, royalty agreements. David, what, where does P sit in, in all of that? You're asking me? Yeah, I'm asking you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think we all know we're seeing no retail investments or no, no retail interest in the public markets at present and nor for the last few years. Um, we're, 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 as, we, as we said, we're a private equity fund, so we tend not to look at public companies. We have made one or two investments in public companies, and they have been the problem ones because of the way the markets are judging them um, trading at a fraction of the NPVs. So we've, we've really taken the decision if we invest in a public company from here on, we will aim to privatise it and we will discuss that with management at the very beginning. So the answer to your question, I, I think private equity and uh, sovereign wealth funds and the majors to the extent that they are investing, they're the ones driving mining finance at the moment. It's not, the, it's not traditional public markets and retail investors. Yeah, but uh, I mean, just to add to that, I think it's, I think more importantly, I, this is quite a strange sector in the sense of traditionally people have CEOs, CFOs have looked to the public markets for, for, as, a, as a funding source. And I think that the, the fl potential flaw in that is in a volatile sector where you're making long term, very capital intensive decisions, you've got a mismatch in investment horizons. And you know, whilst your, your long only fund might be your friend this week, in three months' time when copper price has gone down, you know, a lot of the investors are then running for the hills. So I think the role that PE, the, the biggest advantage that PE brings to the mining sector is matching long-term capital with long-term decisions. You know, he, 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 and that takes a while. It's a 10-year it's a marriage. I mean, like uh, with Appian, we're a 10-year fund as well. Um, and you've got to appreciate the risks that you're getting into, and that takes time. But one thing for certain is you know, we won't panic when things pan out slightly differently than you hoped for, which is always the case in my experience. Mm. Vern, anything to... Uh... Yeah, and no, it's, it's interesting to, to hear uh, that, that you've been fortunate enough to, to find suitable private companies. I mean, we, we've, we've been looking at uh, um, heading for 300 per annum at projects and um, we've not managed to find a suitable private one. We're certainly looking for that. We would like to do more private uh, transactions, um, but certainly the public markets uh, and, and often bombed out juniors, some of them have very good projects and are um, worthy of, of capital. Um, we, we think we've found four so far which we've invested in and, and we hope to do a, an investment rate of about three to four per annum for the next uh, three or four years and I, I think a, a number of those will be public companies. Mm -hmm. um, uh, looking at the private sector, I was in, in um, Peru and Chile uh, two weeks ago and, and uh, meeting some family owned type businesses and uh, there's quite a big gap between their expectations on, on pricing and what the markets uh, you know, would suggest are correct valuations. And so that tug of war is, is a big one we find in the, in the private sector. Yeah. And also in the public markets, disclosure and, and the degree of, of the quality of uh, 43101s or, or JORC uh, technical reports or others are, are usually higher and, and to better standards than privately owned ones. Sure. But that's a generalization. Sure. But, but we would love to do more small private ones. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't want to talk too much, but I agree there are fantastic opportunities in the public markets. Um, at, the, at the Cape Town in Darba this year, we, we looked at several um, opportunities like this with, with companies trading at less than cash. Companies $30 million in the bank trading at 20 million and no value at all for the asset. So I agree there are great bargains. But as private equity now, we, we, we want to go in and privatize these companies and, and get real value for our, for our own shareholders. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Julian, the sort of investment banker perspective on private equity? Isn't yeah, I mean, I mean so far, m most of the activity we've seen has been <coughs> what I would call growth capital, as opposed to the, the standard PE leveraged buyout, take private after production uh, model. 
And I really do think that um, right now there's an obvious opportunity because there aren't that many other sources of capital. Uh, but secondly, I think there's going to be an ongoing uh, source of opportunity because you know, the very best discoveries you know, have a, a good run in the, in the public markets. And, and generally speaking, somebody pops up and wants to own them. So they, so they get taken out. But, but there's a, there's a, uh, a rich seam of, of second tier companies which, which are very attractive in terms of their projects, but are going to go through a diff very difficult period uh, before they can actually build uh, and bring their minds into production. And that, that's a real sweet spot for focused long-term capital to, uh, to access opportunities, in my view. So I, I see this as a, an ongoing trend. I think the other thing is that you know, a lot of people have, have, they like the sector, they see the, the scope for really quite huge returns, um, are now thinking, gosh, you know, we've had the commodity price correction that we've all been waiting for, um, but what do I invest in? And, and having a, a channel through which you can invest where you know that uh, somebody's sifting opportunities and you've got real expertise uh, uh, guiding where that, those equity dollars go, you know, it's quite attractive to, to people. So I think this is, this is not going to be temporary. I think it's going to be something which is, is here for the long run. Mm. Bingo. I, I guess in, in terms of the few points mentioned, there was always this um, tension between private companies um, and public companies and filling the gap in the equity capital markets. But there was a common theme that PE clouded very much in front of companies or in spaces which were feasibility study, bankable, bankable feasibility study. If you talk to all these hardworking teams now, they have all seen 500, 1,000 projects. So slowly this pipeline is getting thinner. And as there was less money spent on exploration in the last few years in the majors as well as in the junior space, I think PE has to reorientate and differentiate itself more, which could be projects that were around and have a debt overhang, yeah? so companies that really need to reorganize themselves, or PE really goes further out and say it becomes more risk capital again. And I guess most of the fund have done successful first investments, which means they have learned, and the LPs in particular have become more comfortable where they are right now, and they can venture out more into different spaces geographically, but also in the stage of development. Just interested in the um, what, what's the cost of a capital you're raising? You know your hurdle rates and and how how does that compare to say sovereign funds who are investing in the space and, and uh, you know, strategic investors companies? Um, and you talked about the long term nature of it, Mark. And, mm. and uh, but but what are your investors looking for by way of return? Look, I, I think there's I can't speak for for, for sovereigns or. Mm. Um, you know, because o often their investment decisions are driven by political rationale rather than necessarily rational financial theory. Um, but what I can do is speak for us, um, and when we're evaluating an opportunity, just as a rule of thumb, we'd be looking for a sort of minimum, depending on the risk, so there are, you know, this is just a generalization, so three times our money back over the course of the investment, mm -hmm. and that's a, a multiple of our book cost. Yeah, uh, I suspect you similar. Yeah. <laughs> yep, we're joined at the hip. Uh, yeah, we, we would be targeting uh, returns over the average returns over the life of the fund, which could extend you know, maximum 12 years uh, of two and a half times multiple of money plus. Um, but as, as Mark uh, mentions, there are, uh, you know, there's the risk return issue, so there might be a, a particular country or a particularly small niche commodity that you would expect to get uh, much more than that uh, given the risk and, and the, yeah. the small scale of the market for it, mm. for its product, uh, whereas a plain vanilla lovely copper or gold project in a safe jurisdiction it would ha have a different risk return profile. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we're, a, we're the same. Uh, also, we look for a minimum three times return over the life of the fund. And if we don't see it, uh, we analyze it very closely at the beginning. If we don't see it, we, we don't invest. Um, and uh, I, I wouldn't say our own investors are risk averse. They're, they're as risk averse as all other investors. But we're in, we're in a market where interest rates are so low um, that the people backing us have said, well, 
we'd like a better return, so we're prepared to take a little bit more risk. So, um, yeah. We're the same three times. Yeah. I, mean, I, think yeah. you've got to, I don't think, look, there's no one size fits all here. Yeah. Um, and it's not about just looking at a spreadsheet and seeing what a financial return is either, because you can look at a project that has a 5x on it. But if it doesn't have a management team that has the capability, or should I say the desire and hunger um, to develop its project, that return is theoretical. There is no value really other than option value until the tons of, or pounds of copper, tons of coal, or whatever it might be, is actually dug out the ground. And as, you know, as the bankers in this room, the project financiers in this room, and service providers in this room will testify, there is a huge number of hurdles you've got to get over before you can take what is a concept through to a cash flow generating um, concept. Um, and so from our perspective, you know, we would often you know, sacrifice some return if you have a seasoned management team who actually can deliver and have the wherewithal technical, financial and commercial to deliver on what their, what their glossy presentations are saying. Yeah, and I suppose that leads into uh, you know, what is uh, your ideal investment. Uh, Sorry, just before that, yeah. the, the point about risk and return, um, uh, our LPs aren't investing with us to have a low risk, a high return business uh, yeah. model uh, investment. They, they want risk uh, in real assets, and, and in this particular case, mining and metals as part of the, the real assets bucket, which includes you know, oil and gas, timber land, real estate, and so on. But they, want, they do not want unrewarded risk. Mm. They want rewarded risk. Mm. But and, I, I, and that's I, I, what they, they're investing for. They're not looking at downside. We, we're looking at downside in underwriting transactions at certain prices but they're looking to make uh, extraordinary returns in the real asset uh, bucket. Right. Robert, can Julian. I just uh, come yeah. in on this as well? I mean, I think, I mean, your question seemed, seemed to be going to competitiveness between mm. sovereigns and, and privacy, uh, and indeed strategics, but I'm not, um, I'm not convinced the, uh, the, the, the different groups are fishing in the same pond. A lot of our sovereign clients actually prefer to invest behind private equity right? for the same reasons that we were talking about before, right? They feel, they feel comfort um, that they, you know, they have people there who know what they're doing. The se second thing is when sovereigns make a, a direct investment, it tends to be coming from um, uh, not so much from their private equity group but more from their, their general investment fund and they tend to go for much bigger companies, right? So, so again, they're fishing in, the same, in, a, in a different pond. And then thirdly, I think as regards strategics, um, you know, I think the growth capital point here, again, it's, it's different. The strategics are not going for those, uh, for those targets. Um, they tend to be going for the you know, bigger resource, um, bigger reserves uh, opportunities. But, but I also think that you know, it's horses for courses. I mean, what, what we see in oil and gas, for example, is you know, where we have an asset. And Iron Ore Company of Canada was probably similar. Where you have an asset which, which has a lot of infrastructure, it's in a safe jurisdiction, it's very leverageable, people can get quite clever around how they structure the deal, then, then, then sponsors right, can actually be more competitive than strategics. Right? So it really depends on, on what you're trying to sell as to you know, which, is the, uh, which is the best uh, buyer group. Having said that, as a banker, you never want a, uh, a set of uh, buyers in an auction who are just sponsors, because pretty soon they'll figure out there's no exit. But, uh, but, but generally, you know, it really depends on, on the asset. Mm. There's, there's, I think, also another component to uh, other, other perspective to be taken. We usually work for uh, junior companies um, when, when we have PE on deals, and the perceived cost of capital is there significantly higher. Empirically, yes, the cost of capital for, of the fund is probably mid-teens upwards, but as, they, as the fund knows that there will be failures, there is, so to say, a need to achieve a higher return on the individual asset to make up for a possible failure within my portfolio, number one. Secondly, funds also want to have a certain amount of security, which drives up the perceived return on the, or the perceived cost of the equity, because there is a bridge loan in probably at the beginning, then there is a convert or some debt element, mezzanine products in, so that the equity component in the end appears as a relative more expensive capital than just a, a mid-teen uh, mid percentage point. 
Oh, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with that, actually. I think is a lot of, you know, when you've got a single asset company, you know, convertible notes don't give you actually much downside protection anyway, because if things go wrong, you know, everybody is wiped out. <laughs> but there's a lot of people out there in the marketplace today, there's been a proliferation of funds playing in that mezzanine, bridge <coughs> loan type financing. And actually, you know, in some, in some respects, that capital is as expensive as the equity. Um, you know, it's dressed up as, as, as debt and, and CF, CEOs, CFOs, we come across, love it because it avoids dilution. But at the end of the day, you're giving away so much of the uh, economic value in the underlying project. In, in my view, a disproportionate amount, actually. Mm -hmm. Unless, you know, bridge finance is fine if you're 100% certain on your timeline. And we see it time and time again, companies taking on a bridge loan because they think in six months' time mm. there's mm. going to be a re-rating in their share price uh, and they'll be then more amenable to issuing equity. But if you cause a delay and if you have a project in Africa uh, or somewhere where yeah. permitting delays are, are, you know, uh, uh, happen all the time, you know, you, you're really gambling with your company's project on that right. particular... Well, you know, well, you're really gambling with your company. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, you know, we've seen a, a, lot of, a lot of situations where hedge funds have come into uh, companies, more in oil than, than in mining so far, and, and, event, and the, 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 the board has effectively lost the company mm. because the, the hedge fund caused the loan and, and it's game over. Mm. Mm. Uh, you talked at the outset about uh, some of the investments you've been making and, and uh, maybe you can just elaborate on that. The, uh, what, what are you uh, targeting? Um, are you looking for outright purchases, strategic investments, um, uh, and, and geographical areas and, yeah. and, and, and the like? Well, we, I mean, we, we're a we have a global mandate, um, probably much like Appian, uh, and there's no particular restriction on which country or commodity we can invest in. If there are restrictions, they're self-imposed, so we, we tend to evaluate political risk on, on a country-by-country -country, uh, basis. Um, in terms of, of what we're looking for, um, we have a, have a strong preference for base metals and, and, and pressures at present, um, and we have a sort of quite comprehensive database in-house on you know, the supply-demand uh, dynamics of, of most commodities. I think for us, we're looking for... You know, the bottleneck in this industry actually isn't the, the resource. There's, you know, roll the clock back 12 years ago, so global exploration expenditure was about three, three and a half billion dollars a year, and that includes the majors. In 2011, that same piece of analysis was pointing towards $16 billion being spent per year on exploration. There's plenty of resources out there. The bottleneck is actually on management teams. And so for us, there is an element of self-selection when we're looking at an opportunity. The ones that we tend to be more successful on are ones where the, the management team sort of embrace our approach, which is a collaborative approach to investing. We're not looking to buy assets, we won't buy shares, we won't buy projects. We're looking to, through primary investments, whether it's primary placements <coughs> of equity or, or convertibles, um, looking to put money in and maximize the amount of dollars that go into value creating work streams, whether it's pre-feasibility studies, feasibility studies or, or construction. And we're looking to sit on a register as a shareholder with significant influence. Uh, we're a significant minority shareholder. Um, at the end of the day, it's our money we're investing. The company is renting that money from us, and we expect it back plus a return. Uh, and we like to think that we've built a team in-house um, that you know, has, has made its own mistakes in, in one form or another uh, in the past, whether it's as a mine manager or a construction engineer. And we like to think we speak the same language as, the, the, as our counterparts sitting across the table. Uh, you know, we've been there and, and, and sort of lost the T-shirt, as it were. Um, so we're looking at very much, and I'm sure Appian are very similar, it, it, it's a collaborative approach to investing where you've got to have a good management team in place. It doesn't have to be complete, uh, and they rarely are because they haven't had the luxury of a big balance sheet to, big, to, to build a big uh, owner's team. But you've got to have that sort of core management focus who are very passionate about building their project. I don't know if you'd agree with that, Vern. Uh, yeah, largely. Uh, and just on that, that point about management and incentivization of management, uh, it's difficult currently because very often 
the CEO, CFO, and, and, and senior uh, mining people are, you know, their options are underwater, the stock price is down, uh, they perhaps joined uh, it towards, you know, the middle or the tail end of the last super cycle. And so uh, the issue of management incentivization in the new world, which is a more, a more uh, downbeat one and will be, we think, for a couple more years, is, is, uh, it's key to get the right incentivization in place with the management team who, who uh, are crucial to it. Uh, and yes, collaboration is, is needed and we think we have the, the, the sort of mining expertise and experience from our, our technical colleagues who've built over 60 mines to, to help and work with management to add value, add fundamental value by ramping up production or getting something into production in, in, in an efficient, economically efficient way. Um, but it, it's, it's a challenge. Uh, management uh, is, is not widely available in terms of high quality management. And mm. a, a lot of people are feeling a bit bruised after the, the, the helter skelter of, of the share prices that have been uh, you know, trending down for a couple of years now. And that's a big challenge to, to get the team properly focused and on board. Yeah, okay, well, it, it sounds as if we're all singing from the same yeah. hymn sheet yeah. here. We, we didn't rehearse this. Yeah. But I agree completely with what my colleagues have said. Um, the word we use is alignment, and internally we talk a lot about alignment. So when we look at a project, we really look for an alignment between our ambitions and the management's ambitions. And if we don't see alignment, we really don't, don't want to invest because we want a shared vision um, we want a significant stake. We don't want to control it. We're not trying to get 50%. We're happy with a significant stake, board representation, and uh, a conviction that managements are aligned with us and we have the same vision and we're working uh, to the same goals. It's very important to us. Um, we, we're, we're very much Africa focused. I've, I've spent, I did my PhD in this country in geology and then uh, moved out to Africa in my uh, 20s and I'm now 61. Um, so I've worked in and around the mining industry in Africa my whole career and uh, some of my colleagues in the fund are in the same boat. We, 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 we've worked all over Africa um, and we feel we have an advantage in Africa that we wouldn't have in South America. Um, we're in the UK and Africa's in the same time zone. Uh, we feel the Canadians and other, other groups would have an advantage over us in other, other um, jurisdictions. So we're very Africa focused and we've spent years building a very, very substantial database of Africa. Uh, so we have satellite imagery, geophysics, soil geochemistry, stream sediments all over Africa. Um, a lot of it is proprietary information that we've gathered um, over the years um, on projects we've worked on and when we've done collaborations, because we have a history. The fund, our fund started three years ago, but we had a long history in Africa before that. Um, Commodity-wise, we, uh, we don't look at oil and gas. We don't have any expertise and we don't understand it. But um, we look at it, all the other commodities and uh, we're, we're very much opportunity-driven. If we see a good copper uh, project, we'd be glad to invest. If we see a good gold project, we'd be glad to invest. So that, that's us, Africa, and um, more or less any commodity. And alignment with management, probably most of all. And are you more exploration stage yeah. than production or pre-production yeah, stage? We, yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think more, we're more further up the yeah. curve. Yeah, the, 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 these guys are a good, uh, a good exit for us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's good to see some space between you at last, um, because one of the questions we had was, was differentiation, and, and you know, if, if you've got a, a company that's looking for, for your funding, uh, you know, how do you differentiate yourselves? And it, it sounds like that's, that's one, one way of doing so, uh, stage of exploration, um, uh, geography, other issues that we're Look, drawing I, I think this is a relationship business. Hmm. I, look, there are obvious headlines uh, that you can differentiate, whether it's yeah, the proposed entry price or the, you know, the, 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 the rights or requirements that the fund is asking for and the quantum they're proposing to invest. And, and they're all pretty differentiate. But I think when it comes down to it, it's whether or not, you know, if, if I were a CEO of a mining company, whether you're able to successfully build 
a, a relationship. This is a 10-year minimum, 10-year marriage. Yeah. Uh, and you've got to be able to work together. It is a partnership from that perspective. Yeah, it's also interesting. Uh, there's a phenomenon where juniors who are desperate for capital will welcome it. But once it's on board, even if it's a large shareholding, say 19.9%, uh, they, they then sort of not so sure. Conveniently that forget it. <laughs> they conveniently forget who's provided it and why. And, and like to just keep paddling their own canoe. And, and that's, yeah. that's an issue to address as well. Yeah. I think the, uh, Robert, I mean, I think the, the issue of differentiation largely goes to, to seeking investment capital, right? So LPs. So which, which you know, how do you, how do you propose something which is a little different? Um, and that's effectively reflecting the in investor community. I'm not convinced that that's the answer, though. I mean, that it's a global business. There are at least two windows, possibly three, to, to invest in. And having a, a flexible mandate uh, has got to be the, the way to go. Um, you also see some funds that, that can't invest. You know, some of the early funds can't invest you know, pre-bankable um, pre feasibility study. You know, that's incredibly limiting, right, as a, as a concept. So, so the maximum flexibility, provided you believe in the private equity firm, has got to be the, the right answer. Unfortunately, firms have to differentiate uh, to, to persuade people to put capital in them. Yeah. But I, look, you know, one of the early comments you made about, I, I can't remember the statistic, 10 billion raised or order 15 billion raised. At, at the end of the day, I, I don't think you know, a lot of that money is in the hands of people. I don't even know if X2 is included in that piece of analysis, but certainly a lot of very, very large generalist um, funds. And, and frankly, they're not looking at the junior end of the, of the space. I mean, they're not, you know, we bump into to, to, to Appian and, and, and Tembo and others, you know, similar like-minded like individuals. And this is a big pond you know, the capital needs of this industry are significant. As we all know, you need to, uh, the overworn expression that you need to invest just to stand still in this sector to replace the reserves you've mined in your current year. So I think that there's plenty of space for, for funds to co-invest and collaborate, you know, so you have a sort of club type solution as well. It's not all about being the only fund that invested. Yeah, I agree. And, and you would look at club deals, each of you. Yeah, no, I think so. I think you, know, you probably get the same answer, which is all of us have active, and in fact, Vern alluded to it at the beginning, we all have active co-investment programs. Uh, our LPs love it for obvious commercial reasons. Um, but, you know, even then, it's, it, it, from my perspective, it's about a collective, you know, co-investment is great, but let's be honest, our LPs who are consummate generalists can't really bring much to bear in terms of technical skills, other, you know, they just bring capital. Mm -hmm. And I think bringing, you know, working, you know, we, we've invested in the same um, uh, c company as Appian. It's about bringing a collective brains trust to bear on a particular challenge. And it's not just a technical challenge, it can be a political uh, or, 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 or yeah. development, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. I think in, the, in the, co the co investment space is very interesting, particularly in Africa, because you had around 12 very large and more and more concentrating generalist African funds. Um, and they obviously don't take the lead on the technical due diligence, but if a senior mining PE fund takes the lead, and we have a few cases currently, um, these funds become more and more comfortable. And I think we will see over the next six, six to 12 months quite a few significant deals where we have African. Uh, generalist PEs co-investing with mining PEs. Mm. And on the, on the question on, on kind of outright acquisition, I guess most, most proponents sitting here are more in the exploration and development space. I think there's a general understanding that on the one hand because pre-money discounts in the pressure space start at 75% and go to start at 95% for bulk commodities, it's almost impossible to to create an agreement how to outright buy a company that has hmm. kind of a feasibility study with a billion but trades at like 15. Uh, yeah. So there's on the one side the, the request from PE investors, everything, everything goes into the ground in a negotiation impasse that is hard to overcome even if an, a current investor wants to take money out, the PEs wouldn't rather allow it. Right. <clears throat> there was discussion on one of the earlier panels about um, uh, 
uh, distress situations and, and those being uh, the, the near-term opportunities, uh, companies, public companies, bond funded and the like. Uh, but, but are you constrained in terms of your investment to investing in equity? Uh, you wouldn't go in and take debt positions in companies. You're, you're a pure equity play. <laughs> Look, I, I think you, know, to, you can easily put a label to these mm. things. At the end of the day, we're a private equity fund, <coughs> and we need to earn equity-type returns. So mm. yes, you can put a bridge finance on it, but it's, it's going to have an equity return. So mm. frankly, you're dressing, dressing some, something up, which, is, which, it's, uh, which it's not. Um, but you know, so primarily we look at sort of vanilla equity, yeah. certainly in our case. <clears throat> yeah, we, we, we do equity. We've done convertible, exchangeable. Uh, we've done a royalty. We've done a bridge loan, but very short term. Um, but, but typically debt wouldn't make sense. But we will certainly look at distressed situations where debt owners perhaps control the company and they're not natural mining investors. And so we will look at, yeah. at uh, working out or that sort of transaction. Yeah, yeah we're, we're the same. We would make a short-term loan, but at long, long term, it doesn't, it doesn't work for us. Um, we, want a three, we want a minimum three times return. So uh, unless, uh, unless we find a lunatic willing to pay us 300% interest, um, it just won't work for us. <laughs> oh, there are lots of those. Are okay. <laughs> yeah. I think there people are, would love to pay No, there are some. There yeah. are some. Julia, I think you do get some desperate people. <laughs> so it's also, you know, it's, it's just a function of the times too. I mean, we, in, in the oil and gas space, we're seeing a huge amount of activity from special situations funds that are attached to the large private equity funds that you were talking about earlier, uh, Mark. And those guys are effectively see the opportunity to get equity light returns, but with the security of, of debt products, short-term capital, basically. And that's why you're seeing uh, such an such a increase in activity. But, but it, you know, it's not sustainable, right? You, you, will, let, you will go back to uh, conventional equity uh, uh, investments um, you know, as, the, as the cycle turns. So I think it's a sign of the times. What, what do Barclays do? What do you do? We, we don't, right? So we have a, so I, I head up the, the advisory part of the, of the bank, so we're service providers. We have Barclays Natural Resources of Investors, which is completely separate. Mm. And, and their model is to back management teams. It's the same as you guys. Mm -hmm. Probably a little earlier, right? Yeah. Probably more, more your model, David, than uh, your colleagues. But, uh, but that's the model, it's, it's equity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, uh, this is interesting. I was actually talking to um, another bank it's a bank you've all heard of. It wasn't, it wasn't Barclays. And uh, he, he said to me, this was recently, and he said to me that they're drifting away from debt finance um, for um, early mining projects, for development stage. And he, he, said, he said, we've learned the risk is very high and we get a return of interest on debt. And he said to me, you guys, you, it's, it's worth you taking the risk because you, you've got an equity interest, but we just... Get in, we just get a debt interest and the risks are too high. He said, so we're drifting away from this as a bank. The, 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 you know, and, and, the, and he's talking about projects which have bankable feasibility studies signed off by experts uh, at development, but there's still um, the, 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 these, uh, these development risks, which... And from, from, from our perspective on, on the restructuring, we were involved in a few cases last year, which probably didn't start as defense mandates or restructurings, but with the falling commodity prices slid into restructuring cases. Some of them um, companies that actually had invested their, their, their capital and were operating. I think the issue is only when, when then commodity prices fall, and especially if, if the debt instruments are traded, things start to accelerate dramatically. And, and at that point, most PE, mining PE funds really do bottom up, the asset needs to be a good asset, and then comes the team, et cetera, et cetera. Then there is a time question. Can you actually, in this compressed timeline, do the things as thorough as you usually would like to do them if you want to do an investment in, the, in this situation? Uh -huh. It's quite interesting, I mean, just to pick up on, on, that, on that point. Um, you know, what we, the world we exist in now is, is where we've got very segmented pools of, of capital. Um, and you know, when one of those pools gets turned off, then it kind of de derails the rest. Mm. If you go back and, and you think about how the sort of mining merchant banks worked, um, you know, 
you effectively put in equity early on. You then advise the, the company. Uh, and then you deliver the debt finance. And in doing so, you de-risk your own equity. And, and off you go. And, and that model works really well. It's just it's very, very difficult to make work, given the regulatory environment that we find ourselves mm. uh, in. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, I wonder how it's going to evolve, mm. actually, I have to mm. say, because that, that, that model is, is proven. Mm. Well, we're running up against our time slot. Uh, any questions from out there? Uh, no? Well, I'd just like to thank our panelists for uh, shedding some light on the secret world of private equity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.